to the sum of the entropies of all the parts. So an intelligent man like Henri Confermi surely does not write very often just like that. He surely has something in his mind, a counterexample or something. And in fact, uh, he says a few words here, these conditions are not quite obvious and in some cases they may not be fulfilled. When those conditions are not fulfilled, they can play a considerable role. This is exactly the content of what I intend to tell you. So, because of those two lines on entropy, let me show to you this table, where on this line you have typical expressions of Boltzmann, Gibbs, von Neumann, Shannon, entropy, which is essentially the same mathematical object. And uh, here you have the famous minus sum p log p, when all probabilities are equal, you get the formula which is on the gravestone of uh, Ludwig Boltzmann in Vienna. But I'm going to talk a lot about this line, where you see immediately there is an extra index, q. When you take q going to 1, you recover this line. So I'm not talking about an alternative concerning the thousands of systems where Boltzmann Gibbs uh, statistical mechanics are absolutely marvelous, but uh, I'm talking about a generalization of it because Boltzmann Gibbs entropy is a particular case of what I'm going to talk. So there is a million ways of generalizing a function p log p, and this is one of that million. Why that one? It's a long story that I will not have time to go through in this occasion, but let me tell you that this is a kind of minimalistic, a kind of Zen generalization of that one, in the sense that uh, practically it satisfies many important properties of this, like concavity, extensivity, and I will come back, many others, but of course it must violate something, because the only th yes. Yes. Oh, it's a, in principle, it's a real number, a real number by now. It depends, it depends on the particular system. It will have upper bound, lower bound. You are absolutely right. The, the correct definition uh, is put here for all probabilities different from zero. Otherwise, it diverges. Yes, you are absolutely right, yes. So, I was going to tell you we must violate something. We are going to violate additivity. This expression is additive. This expression is non-additive. And uh, I will talk about that. So, this table can be rewritten in a more compact and elegant way here by using Q logarithm of X defined like this. So if you take q going to 1, the q logarithm becomes logarithm. And the inverse function, which is the q exponential, becomes exponential. So the table can be written, as you see, in a more elegant way, log, log, q log, q log. And a mathematician said that well represented, half solved. So it's very interesting to use those functions, q logarithm and q exponential, because they will make our life easier. So, here you have the definition of additivity and extensivity. So, additivity, I take it from the book of Oliver Penrose, 1970. An entropy is additive when for any two probabilistically independent systems A and B, the entropy of the sum equals the sum of the entropies. If this is not so, then it is non-additive. So it's very simple. So you can immediately prove that SQ satisfies this, and therefore, when Q is different from 1, SQ is non-additive. When Q equals 1, this cross term disappears, and you recover Boltzmann, which is additive. So additivity is very simple. If you have uh, a new entropy in your pocket, you verify whether it is additive or not in 10 minutes, 15 minutes, that's all. It's a very simple property. That one is, yes. 
Yeah, what is, he's asking what is probabilistically independent in the sense that the probability, the joint probability of a system A and B factorizes into the probabilities of A and probabilities B. This is an important point because, for example, within Boltzmann-Gibbs framework, Fermi-Dirac statistics and uh, uh, Bose-Einstein statistics for an ideal gas, they are not probabilistically independent. And this is why Maxwell-Boltzmann statistical mechanics is different from Fermi-Dirac and Bose-Einstein, in spite of the fact that all of them use the Gibbs, the Boltzmann-Gibbs logarithmic entropy. So it's an important point, yes. Extensivity is much, much more subtle. Extensivity says that the entropy, when the system is large, is proportional to the number of, of particles, to the number of degrees of freedom. So extensivity depends not only on the mathematical functional entropy that you have adopted, but also on the correlations between the elements of the system, which can make the problem very, very hard. Whereas these you can answer yes or no in 15 minutes, you might be unable to answer yes or no in 15 years for what concerns extensivity. So let me illustrate this. If I call W the total number of possibilities with non-zero probability, the point you raised, assumed to be equally probable, then if W increases logarithmically with n, for example, n coins, you have 2 to the power n, then you must use uh, Boltzmann-Gibbs entropy because if you take the expression of the logarithm of W, it is proportional to n and this is thermodynamically okay. So you should use that one. But in complex systems where you have uh, a lot of interactions of, uh, uh, of correlations that are uh, that can be very, very strong, it might happen that this becomes this. This is to say it increases as a power law and not as an exponential in function of n. Then, if you use Boltzmann entropy, you take the logarithm of this and it's going to be proportional to the logarithm of n. And you don't want the logarithm of n, you want n, because you want to satisfy the Legendre structure of thermodynamics. But if you take SQ with Q equal 1 minus 1 divided by rho, the same rho that you have there, then it is proportional to n, and that's okay. Of course, you can have hundreds, infinite, different functions, and you can have, for example, a stretch exponential. If it is like this, none of these works, and uh, you must use another entropy that I will briefly describe uh, later, that I will call S delta, and that is delta, if you take delta equal 1 divided by gamma, the same gamma that you have here, then it is proportional to n, and that's okay. But you can immediately verify that this number, which is this, is much larger than this and much larger than this, which uh, at, the end of the, at the end of the day, this means that the Lebesgue measure of occupancy of the phase space here is finite, whereas here it is zero. So here you have mu times mu times mu times mu times mu n dimensions, and this is finite. This goes to zero compared to this. So this is the big difference where Boltzmann-Gibbs entropy fails to be thermodynamically correct. I gave a seminar like this at the Ecole de Physique et Chimie, and there was a Russian in, uh, that accompanied me to, to have lunch, and uh, he told me, I understood your theory. It's Anna Karenina. I said, Anna Karenina, wh what do you mean? He said, uh, well, Leo Tolstoy. I said, yes, but uh, what it has to do with <laughs> my theory? And he said, because the first lines of Anna Karenina are, all happy families are alike. Each unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. And this is very pertinent, 
because there is only one way of being independent, which is this. And there is a million of different ways of being strongly correlated. So here you have a simple expression, which is P log P, and that's it. But for the others, you need extra indices in the entropic functional. So I liked it so much that here you have it. So summarizing what I said, you have the Boltzmann entropy, which is additive. You have SQ, which is non-additive. You have S delta, which is non-additive. If you have this class of systems, you must use Boltzmann because it is extensive. And you must not use SQ nor S delta. If you have this family, you must not use Boltzmann. And you must use this, SQ, and not that one. If you have this family, you must not use these and these, and you must use that. So you understood what is the frame. If you marry it with Boltzmann, you stay here until the death separates you. But uh, believe me, there is a better marriage, which is with Clausius and thermodynamics, and then you stay here. It happens that this line coincides with this line at this class. This is why 140 years of confusion between physicists that tend to consider additive and extensive as synonyms, but I'm showing to you that they are not. Why I say that uh, thermodynamics is a better marriage than Boltzmann? For a lot of reasons that I will not have the time to expose to you, but let me just quote one of those reasons, a historical one, Einstein, in 1949, he, know, he wrote, a theory is the more impressive, the greater the simplicity of its premises is, the more different kinds of things it relates, and the more extended is its area of applicability. Therefore, the deep impression that classical thermodynamics made upon me. It is the only physical theory of universal content concerning which I am convinced that within the framework of applicability of its basic concept, it will never be overthrown. So, this is a historical reason, but you have a lot of logical reasons as well that I am skipping. Uh, let me make a, a metaphor, because Aristoteles said that with metaphors we understand better. So let me make a metaphor. Here you have the Galilean addition of velocities. So if you are on a boat, on a train, going to 20 kilometers per hour, and the train goes to 100 kilometers per hour with respect to the land, then you are going at 120 kilometers per hour with regard to the, gun, to the land. That's the Galilean composition of velocities. But Einstein's composition is like this. It's more complicated. You see, here you do it by head. Here it's a little bit bothering because you have the velocity of light. You have to do this little calculation. You lost additivity, but uh, you gained something much more important than additivity. Uh, Einstein used the Lorentz invariance, and with that he could unify Maxwell electromagnetism and mechanics. This is more important than this simple rule. So you lost additivity, but you gain uh, unification between electromagnetism and mechanics. A small price to pay. Here, uh, you have what happens uh, comparing this, uh, uh, this expression of additivity of velocities. It, con it contains the Galilean expression when the velocity of light goes to infinity or when the velocities are small compared to the velocity of light. You recover it, so this is a particular case. Here, you lost uh, additivity of the entropy, but you gained thermodynamics. You gained extensivity, a small price to pay, not a big deal. 
And here, if you have the Q exponential function, it uh, recovers the famous uh, Boltzmann weight when Q goes to 1 or when beta energy is small. This is to say the energies are small compared to the temperatures. So you have, you recover it, but you lose the additivity of the entropy. So as I said, I consider this a small price to pay. You may say, yes. Of what? Well, I, mean, I will dedicate all this talk to answer your question partially. So here, you might say, since you violated additivity, just a minute, Eduardo. Since you violated additivity, why don't you violate extensivity also? Why you retain this? Well, because we don't see the need. Uh, you could say, why not generalizing uh, Lorentz transformation? Because up to now, we don't see the need of it. Uh, you generalize a lot of things when you have a strong reason for doing that. So Lorentz transformation is fine for relativity and for a lot of other things, so we don't see why generalizing. Here, we don't see why generalizing extensivity, so we want to satisfy thermodynamics. Yes, uh, Eduardo, I think. Yes, yes. Yes, yes, the sum of probability. Here, we're not generalizing theory of probability. It's the one that you studied, and I also studied. It's the same. Um, so let me show to you one example that exhibits how this works. This was done with Filippo Caruso, with at the time he was a student at the Scuola Normale Superiore di Pisa, and uh, he spent some time in Brazil. And here you have, for example, this Hamiltonian, a simple chain. When you take gamma equal 1, this term disappears. And you have an old friend of statistical mechanics. You have the Ising model in the presence of a transverse field. If you take gamma equal 0, you have this plus this. You have the scalar product. You have another old friend of statistical mechanics, the XY model. OK. So this is the kind of Hamiltonian that you can have in your mind. What we do is that we consider the system at zero temperature, and therefore it is in a pure state. It is in the ground state, uh, where it has a phase transition at lambda equal 1. So there is a critical point at zero temperature. And uh, on one side, it is paramagnetic. On the other side, it is ferromagnetic. And there you have a quantum phase transition. So this is the point we are going to focus on. At uh, the level of the n system, of the n elements, n spins, it's a pure state. And therefore, the entropy is 0. Whatever reasonable entropy should be 0 for a pure state. But what we do is we consider part of the n. So n is very large, and we consider l within n, and we, we trace over n minus l. And when you have this, this is not a pure state. And therefore, its entropy is not 0, and this is what we calculated, this entropy. So when you do that, sq, and you put q equal 1, you get here logarithm of l. And you don't want logarithm of L. So you change Q. And when you arrive to Q equals 0 0.08, you have a nice surprise, a straight line. So SQ for Q equals 0 0.08 is non-additive, but it is extensive because it is proportional to L. And this is what you want. This particular problem can be generalized in 1 plus 1 dimensions using some results of quantum field theory. And here you have the analytical expression. It's not, it's not easy to have an analytical expression for Q. But once in a while, 
somebody succeeds. So here you have the analytical expression as a function of the central charge. So when you take the central charge equal one half, which corresponds to the Ising model, and this is known since 30, 40 years, you get Q equal square root of 37 minus 6, which is 0 0.08, which Filippo had found numerically. But now here you have it analytically. And if you take the central charge equal 1, you get the result for the XY ferromagnet, and it is this number, 0 0.16, which Filippo also had numerically. So let me represent this function, and here you have it, Q as a function of 1 divided by the central charge. Here you have the Ising model, XY model, other models that have been studied by Francisco Algaraz in Sao Paulo, and you have a line, a blue line, which here contains Boltzmann-Gibbs. When the central charge goes to infinity, you recover Boltzmann-Gibbs. So this is perhaps the most beautiful illustration that we have nowadays, that we are not uh, providing an alternative to Boltzmann where it works well. We are generalizing it. So you see a line, and this line here has a point, which is Boltzmann. Okay, let me skip this. There are some delicatessen to be taken into account in the calculation of Q, but I'm skipping them. Because for these models, the central charge is known. I'm talking about the extensivity of entropy. I, if you take Q equal 1 here, all the, these models become non-extensive. But if you take Q equal this, they are extensive. And we are giving priority to extensivity than to additivity. Sorry? Yes, 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 yes. Here you have another example that appeared uh, a couple of years ago, done in Spain, and they also were able to calculate Q analytically as a function of the parameters of the model. And this M is proportional to the size of the spin, and when S goes to infinity, M goes to infinity, and this recovers Boltzmann, Q equal 1. So again, if the spin is very, very large, you go to classical mechanics, and there is no reason for changing anything with regard to Boltzmann. Uh, let me now go to another problem, not ferromagnetism that I was looking there, but let me go to black holes, the famous area law. So here you have a paper by Hawking, 76, and uh, the, um, the abstract of this paper is Fantastic. He says a black hole, etc., can have a large number of different internal configurations. The logarithm of this number can be regarded as the entropy of the black hole. So he's using Boltzmann entropy, logarithm of W. Uh, but here he says that uh, black holes have negative specific heat. They cannot be in stable thermal equilibrium. This means that the standard statistical, mechanical, canonical ensemble cannot be applied when gravitational interactions are important. This is uh, amazing. This is uh, the Boltzmann-Gibbs weight. He says that this doesn't work, but he says that the entropy from where this comes is okay. So he denies uh, Boltzmann here, and he accepts Boltzmann here, in those two expressions that, in principle, are directly related. It's not only him, not only Hawking. A whole list of people, some of them are Nobel Prizes, Jacob Bekenstein, uh, Toft, uh, many others, Michael Duff, Juan Maldacena, etc. So, in particular, you have this letter that appeared in, um, in Nature, 1993, Everybody who knows about entropy knows that it is an extensive property. 
Of course, there is more than that to entropy, which is also a measure of disorder. How is this disorder measured? How? P log P, something else? Probably is putting the question. So why the entropy of a black hole proportional to the square of its radius and not to the cube of it? Why to the area rather to the volume? So all these people have this kind of statements in their papers. There you have another one. He says here in the abstract, 2006, the area as opposed to volume proportionality of black hole entropy has been an intriguing issue for decades. And you have more here by a great specialist, Padmamaban. The extensive property of entropy no longer holds. And there are thousands or at least hundreds of papers where you see such statements. So our point of view is going to be the following. The logarithm of W of the black hole is the area. OK. You get this from many places. From This is called the holographic principle. You can get it from field theory, from string theory, from a lot of calculations. And it's OK, so we accept it. This is perfectly admissible and most probably correct. However, is this quantity the thermodynamical entropy? Well, we say no, it's not. This is true, but this is not the entropy. So here you have a full uh, review of modern physics around the area law and everywhere they have uh, that kind of statements area of the sun and not like its volume in sharp contrast with unexpected extens extensive behavior. Of course, logarithm of W does not uh, recover extensivity. Yes, but uh, it happens that I, I think that it is not the entropy. So we did with a student of mine at the time, Leonardo Sirto, a paper in where we propose a way out of this difficulty. And uh, here you have expressions of entropy. Here you have P log P. Here you have SQ. Here you have S delta defined like this. And here you have a unification of all these, and we call it SQ delta. OK. So this is additive, and these are non-additives. And then we used that one, S delta, to show that if you take delta equal 3 half, the S delta is extensive, whereas S Boltzmann is not extensive. But of course, this is again non-additive. Let me remind you that we are using here the uh, equal probabilities expression, which we do not know if it is correct or wrong for a black hole. It might well be incorrect for a black hole to assume equal probabilities. But if you do, you solve the problem of the thermodynamical intriguing problem of black holes. So this was checked uh, quickly by two Japanese that published several papers in Physical Review D. And uh, they use this entropy S delta to make a cosmological calculation. Here you have the red shift. And in green, you have the data of the Planck Observatory, which is up there. And uh, here you have different theories. You have bekenstein hawking theory. You have S delta with delta equal 3 half. You have Einstein uh, general relativity with a cosmological constant lambda. So you have several theories. And all of them coincide up to here. So by now, we cannot differentiate which one is correct, but in a few billions of, of years, we will know. And uh, they present also these calculations, which essentially is the size of the universe as a function of time. Not exactly, they are rescale quantities, but roughly. So here you have bekenstein hawking and it uh, has a curvature which never changes. And therefore, uh, you need to invoke things like black energy because it will never stop accelerating. But delta equal 3 half, as well as the two approaches by uh, general relativity with uh, the cosmological uh, constant, they go up, but then they turn down. So here, in these three, you do not need, at this level at least, to invoke 
for dark energy. But in Bekenstein hoping you do. I confess that uh, I'm happy to be closer to Einstein than to Bekenstein Hawking, without saying that Bekenstein Hawking is wrong. But uh, I feel more comfortable being on the side of this turning up, turning down of the curvature. So let me now refer to this problem of the Boltzmann-Gibbs uh, factor. In the book of Gibbs, 1902, he wrote, in treating of the canonical distribution, we shall always suppose that the equation 92 is finite. Equation 92 is what we call today partition function. As otherwise, the coefficient of probability vanishes and the law of distribution becomes illusory. What law of distribution? His law of distribution. Gibbs knew that if the partition function diverges, his weight doesn't work. So he knew. But many physicists forgot that in between. And Gibbs, as a genius that he was, he also advances an example where this can happen. And his example is gravitation. The system contains material points which attract one another inversely as the squares of their distances. So there you have what Gibbs said about Gibbs weight. So here you might consider a system, a classical one, to make things easier, a classical one, where you have attractive interactions which decay as the inverse of a power, alpha, of the distance, and uh, if alpha is very large, you have short-range interactions. If alpha is very small, perhaps even zero, you have long-range interactions. And in treating this, you can, immediately, uh, you can immediately find out that the energy is integrable if alpha is above d. So here you have alpha, here you have d, here alpha is larger than d, here you must use Boltzmann. But I'm talking about this part. In particular, here you have Newtonian gravitation with d equal 3 and alpha equal 1. So it's in the dangerous region where the partition function diverges. The air in this room clearly is Boltzmann because it is d equal 3 and alpha equal 6 because it's up there. The leonard jones interaction with the Van der Waals attractive interaction. So the air in this room, no doubt, is Boltzmann. But we're talking of this region. And let me show to you a couple of examples along these lines, one, two, three, where we're going to cross from the non-extensive region to the extensive region. See what happens here. So what I'm showing to you is another work by the same student, Leonardo Sirto, and uh, here you have the results he got for the distribution of velocities for the XY model. Distribution of velocities. When alpha is large, say 2, then in log linear you get a parabola. This is to say you get the celebrated Maxwellian distribution of velocities. For 1 million of uh, rotators, which is a tour de force, computationally speaking. And uh, by using only first principle mechanics. In this case, force equal mass time acceleration. That's all. You don't use temperature. You don't use entropy. You use nothing but mechanics. You write one million of equations, two millions, in fact, because there are two degrees of freedom per particle. So you have two million of force equal mass time acceleration. That's all. And you get a Maxwellian distribution when alpha equals 2. But definitively, when alpha is small, 0.9, this is the Maxwellian, and the system does not like Maxwellian. It likes this thing, and the black thing that you see here is a Q Gaussian with Q equal 1.58. So force equal mass time acceleration 
does not like Boltzmann weight when you have long-range interactions. Here you have a very recent example that we are submitting for publication at any moment. And here again, you have the distribution of velocities uh, for alpha equal 0.9. And it doesn't like Maxwellian. This is Maxwellian. It doesn't like it. It likes that one. And that one is a Q Gaussian with Q equal 1.5, 1.6. But here, you have one, two, three dimensions superimposed with alpha divided by D constant. So alpha divided by D is equal to 0.9. So as you see, the statistics of this does not depend on alpha and D. It depends on alpha divided by D, on one parameter instead of two. Here you have Q as a function of alpha divided by D. Here it goes down, and in this region it becomes 1. There is a lot of interesting things to discuss about this, but basically Q is of the order of 1, 6, and then it goes down and it becomes 1 when alpha divided by D is large. Here you have for the same model the distribution of energies. The other one was the distribution of velocities. Here you have the celebrated Boltzmann factor, and it doesn't work. And here you have what it works, and you have here it for alpha divided by D equal 0.9, for D equal 1, 2, 3, and the black line here is a Q exponential. Of course, this does not prove that Q statistics is correct, but this is very impressive. This is a very recent result, and here you are, you are seeing the failure of Boltzmann-Gibbs factor. Yes. Yes, the classical, but with long-range interactions. First neighbor, second neighbor, third neighbor, all of them. Okay? Yes, the classical one. With a kinetic term. So I don't talk about magnetism, I talk about rotators. But this is the classical one. The same thing happens for the Heisenberg model. So, there you have it. The glory and the failure of Boltzmann weight. This is a very impressive paper that appeared one year ago by a Turkish, Tirnakli, and a Brazilian, Ernesto Borges from Bahia, where they could, in a very simple model, the famous standard model, they could see where it comes from, the failure of the Boltzmann scenario. And uh, the standard map is an old map by a Russian, Chirikov, 1969. And here you have it, very, very simple, with two dimensions, x and p. And there you have a control parameter which makes the map nonlinear. So what happens with the in-phase space of the air in this room, we will never see because it has uh, trillions of dimensions, so you, you will, we will never see it. We can imagine, as Boltzmann did, but we will never see it. But here it has only two dimensions, so we can see it. So you put it in the computer and you see it. What happens with this particular standard map is one of the most simple and paradigmatic area-preserving map. So this is like a little Hamiltonian, but two dimensions only. It has been used in a lot of things in physics, but uh, what we want to do here is follow Tirnakli and Borges in the calculations they did. So they took k equals 0, 2, uh, position momentum, they have beautiful stable islands, then they increase k 0.6, the same but starts emerging a chaotic sea. k equal 2, a lot of chaotic sea, and there you have the stable orbits, and k equal 10, just a great chaotic sea. No doubt that this is what Boltzmann had in his mind when he invented statistical mechanics, this. Probably he didn't have these kind of things in his mind. He had this, equal probabilities. So these figures, you can find them in any book of uh, uh, nonlinear dynamics. But they did this for figures that you will find in no book of nonlinear dynamics. You find this in their paper. 
So the same values of k, 0 0.2, 0 0.6, 2, 10. And what are they plotting with colors? The Lyapunov exponent. They take a point and they calculate the Lyapunov exponent. If it is almost zero, they put it black. If it is something else, they put it in color. So here, everywhere, you have practically zero Lyapunov exponents. Here, zero Lyapunov exponents, but a little bit of chaotic C, whose Lyapunov exponent is positive. Here, a lot of chaotic C, but still you have this. And here, only chaotic C. Of course, this corresponds to positive Lyapunov exponent. Boltzmann did not call it like that, because when he was inventing statistical mechanics, Lyapunov was a little child, so he couldn't call it Lyapunov exponent. But clearly, he had uh, this idea in his mind. So, for k equal 10, they plot it as a function of the sum of successive iterations of position, successive iterations of, posi of positions, the sum of it, following the scenario of a central limit theorem. And in log linear, they find a beautiful Gaussian. Again, only through first principles, which is what? The map. And they get the distribution of the sum, a beautiful Gaussian. When they do the same thing, but not for k equal 10, but k equal 0 0.2, the system does not like Gaussians. It likes this. And this black is a Q Gaussian. And they checked in a small scale Q Gaussian. They checked in this representation up to 4,000 Q Gaussian, up to 1,000 Q Gaussian, up to 100 Q Gaussian. Definitively, this, we cannot say they have proved that it is a Q Gaussian. But uh, uh, it is so close to a Q Gaussian that we believe it is a Q Gaussian. So there you have it. You change the structure of the sensitivity to the initial conditions, and the system likes or does not like Gaussians. In some sense, yes. Yes. In some sense, yes. The Lyapunov exponent is zero, which means that two nearby initial conditions do not diverge in time exponentially, but lower than exponentially. In fact, in this problem, they diverge as a power law. Exactly. So, let me show to you another example where these things appear. This is due to people from Natal. They are sitting there. Luciano da Silva and Samurai Brito. She's not here today. She's in Rio de Janeiro. So, when I come from Rio, she goes to Rio. You see how life is. So, here we calculated for a scale-free network the distribution of, uh, of uh, number of links, the degree distribution. And uh, we did it for one, two, three, four dimensions. And there you have it, Q logarithm as a function of K, the degree of uh, the links, of the, the nodes. And uh, this is one dimension, two dimensions, three dimensions, four dimensions. You get straight lines, which means that it is Q exponential. So the distribution of velocities is uh, velocity of degrees is a Q exponential, like the distribution of energies that I showed to you before is a Q exponential of the energy. This is a geometrical problem. The other one was an energetic problem with energy. Here you have no energy in principle. You have geometry, but the same results. And therefore, here you have Q as a function of alpha for one, two, three, four dimensions and uh, kappa, which plays the role of temperature here, as a function of one, two, three, four dimensions. And when you represent this as a function of alpha divided by d, you get an universal plot. So again, like as we saw before, what matters is not alpha and d, but the ratio alpha divided by d, which is directly related to the remark of Gibbs 1902. So there you have it, another example. Uh, let me go to the last example of this talk. I want to show to you one illustration of 
hundreds, perhaps at this time that we are talking 1,000 of papers published by people from Brookhaven and even more for the LHC at CERN. Here you have the 27 kilometers of perimeter. It has four detectors, the CMS, ALICE, ATLAS, and LHCB. And here you have the size of the detectors, and there you have a human being. And they invited me to give a talk, and they took me down there in the ALICE detector. And when we arrived there, uh, they showed to me the door. And they asked me, how heavy you think it is the door? Sorry? Y yeah, 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 this, not this this. And they asked me, how heavy you think it is the door? I looked at that door, like, it looked like a James Bond door. Uh, and I said, I don't know, many tons. More than the Eiffel Tower. I said, what? The weight of the door is more than the Eiffel Tower. Yes. And it takes two days to close it. Can you take a picture of me at the side of this door? And there you have it. So, for the CERN experiments, here you have one illustration among many hundreds. This was based on an initial paper by Wong and Wilk. And then again, we, we studied again their data uh, with uh, Sirto and myself. And here you have, in log log, the probability of having a transverse momentum PT in the hadronic jets that appear after the collision between proton-proton. So you have proton-proton, a big mesh, a soup, quark gluon, who knows what, and then it ejects hadrons and they measure the longitudinal part and the transverse part of the hadrons. And there you have it. And uh, these data are the experimental data for several of them, CMS, ATLAS, ALICE, etc. And uh, the lines that you see below are Q exponentials. So you see a coincidence between a simple theoretical analytical expression, which is that one, where the energy is Einstein expression for the transverse momentum, and 14 decades of experimental data. I tried to find anything else in physics that in a single experiment you have 14 experimental decades and I didn't find it. So the first thing here is to say a word about the talent of these experimentalists that are capable of getting 14 experimental decades in a single experiment. And the, single, the second remarkable fact is that a line here goes over 14 decades on top of the experimental data. And here you have Boltzmann. So in this region, Boltzmann is not 20% wrong. Here, Boltzmann is thousands of, uh, uh, of a number of thousands wrong. When the energy is small, are, as it used to be in the time of Fermi and Richard Feynman, Boltzmann is fine, because Boltzmann and Q statistics, they coincide here. So at that time, Boltzmann was fine, but then it's wrong. So this is my last uh, slide. I try to more or less summarize uh, what I told you. And, uh, we try to answer somehow this question. What is typically the appropriate thermostatistics? If this limit is positive, which means that the occupancy of phase space has a positive, a positive uh, Lebesgue measure, it goes everywhere or in 50% of everywhere, then Boltzmann Gibbs entropy is extensive, and Boltzmann Gibbs statistics with standard variables is what occurs indeed. For example, the air in this room, for example, usual phase transitions. But if this limit goes to zero, then you have a zero Lebesgue measure case. And there you have two possibilities. The occupancy being zero Lebesgue measure can be compact. 
can be zero, but in a corner, so it's compact. When you have this, then uh, to have extensivity, you need to use a non-additive entropy. But statistics with L rescaled variables still holds. This is what we realized in this paper, which is appeared a few weeks ago. This is the case of the Ising model with transverse field that I mentioned to you. Uh, probably the case of quantum critical points, the area law, black holes, who knows. And here you have the case where the Lebesgue measure is zero, but it's not compact occupancy, it's a fractal-like occupancy. When you have this, non-additive entropy must be used to have extensivity, and you have Q statistics or delta statistics with L rescale variables, and this is the case of most of the examples that I showed to you. Long-range Hamiltonians, high-energy collisions, scale-free networks, the standard map, and some, some others that I didn't have the time to show to you. With this, I thank you very much. Mm-hmm.